I need your help solving a mystery. Or at least it is a mystery to me. If anyone has information on this, I would surely like to hear from you. In the year 1859 or so, somewhere in western Utah or eastern Nevada, a massacre took place. Somewhere along the Pony Express Trail, east of Ruby Valley and west of the Deep Creek Mountains. The victims were Goshute and Shoshone. According to the account I will read, hundreds of men, women, and children were killed by the U.S. Army under the command of General Albert Sidney Johnston. Now it gives me no pleasure to read this, but this story has troubled me for so long it needs to see the light of day. These people deserve to be remembered. The account came from the book Among the Shoshone by Elijah Nicholas Wilson, pages 170 to 185. In the year 1859 or 60, General Johnston led his army from Camp Floyd in Utah and camped at Fish Springs in present-day western Utah. The site of the massacre was at a small lake at the base of a rugged mountain range a journey of about two to four days on horseback from Fish Springs. The lake was described as being one and a half miles long and about a half a mile wide. My best guess is that it is somewhere between the Deep Creek Station and the Ruby Valley Station on the Pony Express Trail. It was a pre-dawn attack on the camp similar to what happened at the Bear River Massacre in 1863 in Idaho. It happened about the same time as the Paiute War was taking shape around Pyramid Lake in western Nevada. So let me get started with this account. About the time the Indians were at their worst, a small train of immigrants came through on their way to California. They were told by all the station agents that it was not safe for so few people to travel through the country at that time, and that they had better stop until more trains came up. They said they were well armed and thought they could stand off the Indians all right. At that time I was riding from Shell Creek through Egan Canyon to Ruby Valley. We all knew that this train would be attacked somewhere between Deep Creek and Ruby Valley. We who were acquainted with the Goshute Indians could tell when they were going to make a raid. For they would make signs in the mountains, with smokes by day and fires by night. And so by these signs, we knew that this train would be attacked as they were going through some of the bad canyons on the route. Egan Canyon was about the worst of these. It was a narrow canyon about six miles long, with cliffs on each side from 300 to 1,000 feet high, so that you could turn neither to the right nor to the left. This canyon was a dread to all that had to go through it. The train of immigrants entered this canyon just ahead of me. I rode very fast that day to try to overtake them, before they got to the worst part of it. But just before I reached them, I could hear shooting. Then I knew that the Indians were on to them. I stopped a moment to listen, when I saw two men coming. They were bareheaded and were running for dear life. When they got near, they said, Go back! The whole company has been killed but us. They passed me and went on. After a little while I could hear no more shooting, and I started and rode slowly up the canyon. At every turn around a point I would stop and listen and have a look. Soon the wagons came in sight, and I stopped and looked a while, but I could not see anything of the Indians. Then I went up to the wagons, and such a terrible sight I never saw before. Dead men, women, and children were strewn all around the wagons. The tugs of the harness had been cut and the mules and horses were gone. 
I rode to the next point, and as no Indians were in sight, I knew they had gone. So I went back to the wagons to see if any little children might have been overlooked by the Indians. One woman I found lying by the side of the road who is not quite dead. She was lying on her side with her face up and her black hair spread out over a small sagebrush. She gave one gasp as I rode up. I spoke to her but she made not another move. She was dead. I cannot describe my feelings as I sat there on my horse, but I know the tears ran down my cheeks very fast as I gazed on this scene. I saw four little babes, all under one year old, lying by a wagon wheel, where they had been killed, and I could see blood on the hub of the wheel where their little heads had been struck. After I found that they were all dead, I could not stand it to look upon this dreadful scene any longer. So I started on my way. When I got out of the canyon and saw where the Indians had turned off the road, I did not spare my horse until I reached the station. The station keeper sent a messenger to Ruby Valley, where the soldiers were, and they came and buried the dead immigrants. The Indians became so troublesome that the soldiers from Camp Floyd were called out to stop their dreadful work. I got a letter from Major Egan directing me to meet him at Camp Floyd as soon as I could get there, for they wanted me for interpreter and guide for the soldiers. I started at once and made 200 miles in three days. When I reached Camp Floyd, General Albert Sidney Johnston was all ready to start out against the Indians with four companies of soldiers. We traveled west and crossed the great American desert in the night so as not to be seen by the Indians. The soldiers stayed at Fish Springs and sent me out with three other scouts to see if we could find any signs of the Indians we were after. We took only two days rations with us. The first day we met with no success so the next morning we separated. I sent two of the scouts to circle around to the south and took with me a young man by the name of Johnson, and we went northwest. That afternoon we saw two Indians crossing a valley. We kept out of sight but followed them until night and saw them go into a small bunch of cedars. We left our horses and slipped up as close to them as we could without letting them see us. When we got pretty near to them, I recognized in one of the Indians my old friend Yaiabi, but not feeling sure he would be glad to see me, I told Johnson to have his shooting irons ready, and I would go up to them and see what they would do. As soon as they saw me coming, they jumped up and drew their bows. I began to talk to them in their language. Yaiabi did not recognize me at first and demanded to know what I was doing there. I told him I wanted water. He said there was no water except very little they had brought with them. They asked me if I was alone. I told them that another young man was with me. Then I called to Johnson to come up. After Yayabi had found out who I was, he felt better, for they were very uneasy at first. When I asked him how he came to be there, he said they had been out to a little lake to see some Parowan Indians that were camped there. I asked him what the Indians were doing there. He said they were waiting for some more of the Pocatello Indians to come, and as soon as they arrived they were going to burn all the stations and kill all the riders and station keepers. I asked him if he was going with them. They said he was not. Then I asked him why he had been over to see those Indians. He said that the Parowan Indians had stolen his sister's little boy two years before, and he went out to see if they could find the child. I asked if he had found it. He said no. They have sold it to the white folks. Do you know when the Indians they are looking for will be there? He replied that they would be there the next night. I knew it would be a big day's ride back to where the Indians were gathered, and I knew it was a hard day's ride to the place where the soldiers were camped. I did not know what was best for me to do. I had these two Indians, and I did not want to let them go. 
for I was afraid they would skip back and let the others know what the soldiers were after them. Here we were a big day's ride to water, and our horses had none since early morning. So I decided it would be better to take the Indians to headquarters, and let General Johnston decide what to do. I told Yayabi my plans. He said he did not want to go to the soldiers, for he was afraid of them. I told him I would see that the soldiers did him no harm. He said, Yagaiki, you have known me ever since you were a little boy, and you never knew of my doing anything bad in your life. I told him I knew that he had always been a good Indian. But now you know that the soldiers are after those bad Indians and intend to kill the last of them. And if I let you go, you will go to them and tell them that the soldiers are after them. Then, if General Johnston should find out what I had done, he would think I stood in with the Indians, and it would have me shot. So you see, you must go with us to the soldiers' camp. The Indian that was with the Ayabi said he would not go to the soldiers' camp, and started to get his bow. But I had my pistol on him in a jiffy and told him to stand. He stopped, and I kept him there while Johnson gathered up their bows and arrows. When I told them to get ready to start, Yayabi said they were tired and would like to stay there until morning. But I said that our horses were so thirsty, we had better travel in the cool of the night, or we would not be able to get them to camp. So we set out for Fish Springs. I told Johnson to tie the bows and arrows to his saddle and to keep a close watch over them. Yayabi mounted my horse while I walked and led the horse. When I got tired of walking, I changed places with Yayabi. And then young Johnson walked and let the other Indian ride his horse. In this way we traveled until morning. When daylight came, I gave the bows and arrows to young Johnson and told him to go to General Johnston's camp as soon as possible, and send us fresh horses and some water. In about six hours he came back to us, accompanied by two soldiers with some water and two extra horses for the Indians to ride. By traveling pretty fast, we reached camp at one o'clock that day. General Johnston was very much pleased with me for bringing the two Indians in. At the sight of so many soldiers, the Indians were very uneasy. But after they had been given something to eat and saw that they were not going to be hurt, they felt much better. General Johnston talked with the Indians for about an hour, and I acted as interpreter. Yayabi told him just how the big camp of Indians was located, and said there were about 300 warriors there then. They were looking for about 50 more to join them that night. And as soon as they could complete their plans, they were going to burn the stations and kill all the white men they could find. They thought they would be ready in about five days to begin their bloody work. The general was very much pleased by the way Yayabi talked. They called him a good Indian and said he believed he was telling the truth. I told Yayabi what the general said. General Johnston told me to get a little rest, for he wanted me to start out again that night if I would. I lay down and had a little sleep, and when I got up he told me that I was to go to the lake and see if Yayabi had told the truth, and if everything was all right, to send back word as soon as I could by one of the scouts that he would send with me. He said for me to do all my traveling at night and keep under cover in the daytime, and to meet him as soon as I could at a spring about halfway between where we were and the Indians. Then on the following night he would move his soldiers to another spring, which Iabi had told him about, and which was within six miles of the lake where the Indians were gathering. About dark the three of us started with four days' rations. I rode the little pony on this trip, the first I had ridden him for a long time. We traveled all night and reached the first spring at daybreak. I knew it would be a hard night's ride to go from here to the lake, 
and then reach Yayabi's spring in the mountains before daylight. About midnight, we arrived at the south end of the lake, which was only a mile and a half long and a half a mile wide. I had my two scouts stop there while I wrapped a red blanket around me and went on foot to find out what I could about the Indian camp. I had gone only a few steps when I came to a lot of horses, and as I was passing around them I heard an Indian speak to his horse, and that he had ridden him pretty hard that day. I asked him if he had come with the Pocatello Indians. He said he had, and that seventeen others came with him. We will start burning the stations then soon, I said. Were you at the council tonight? he asked. I told him I was not at the council, that I had been following a horse that had started back. He said that at the council it was decided that the Parowans were to go to Ruby Valley and burn and kill everything they came to, and that the Pocatello Indians and the Goshutes were to start at Ibapa and burn towards the east. I asked him when we were to start from there. He said, in four days. We were walking towards their camp as we talked. So as soon as I found out all I wanted to know, I said that I had forgotten my rope and we would have to go back for it. So I parted company with my Indian friend. He was a Shoshone, and he thought I was another. When I got out of his sight, I wasn't long getting back to where I had left the boys and in a very short time one of them was carrying the news to the army. The other scout and I went to find the spring Yayabi had told me about. We got well into the mountains before daylight, and when it was light enough to see, we found the spring up a very rough canyon. We staked our horses so they could get plenty to eat, and then crawled off into the willows for a good nap. That afternoon I climbed a high mountain nearby to see which would be the best way to go from there to the Indians' camp in the night. After I had studied the lay of the country pretty well, I went back to the horses, ate a little cold lunch, and when it commenced to get dark we struck out to meet General Johnston at the appointed place. We did not travel very fast, for I knew we would reach the place before the soldiers could get there. We were at the spring about two hours before daylight and had a good nap before General Johnston came. When he got to us, he wanted to know if I thought it safe to make a fire to boil some coffee. I told him I thought there was no danger, so we made a small fire and had a good cup of coffee, and then we all lay down for a little sleep. At sundown, the packers began loading the hundred pack mules we had with us and we got started just about dark for the Ayabi Spring, which was about six miles north of the Indians' camp. We reached the spring in good time, and were all unpacked before dawn. After breakfast, General Johnston and I went up onto the mountain so that he could see the Indian camp. He had a good pair of field glasses and could see everything very plainly. He asked if I knew anything about that bunch of willows he could see a little to the west of their camp. I told him that I knew it very well, for when the express first started it came this way. And we had a station right where the Indian camp is now. So I had been there many times. He said, then you can take me to it in the night. I told him I could, and pointed out to him the way we would have to go. He told me he wanted to make the attack the next morning at daybreak. We went back to the camp and found all the soldiers asleep except the guard. And in a very short time we were rolled up in our blankets. When I awoke that afternoon, I saw General Johnston and his staff going up the mountain to where we had been that morning. They got back to the camp just before sundown and held a hasty council with the remainder of the officers. Then orders were given to pack up, and we got in line just at dark. I told General Johnston he would have to take his men down this canyon in single file, 
and in some places we would have to travel along the side of the mountain over very narrow trails. That we would have to climb above high cliffs and pass through some very dangerous places. He said for me to go ahead, and when I came to the bad places to dismount, they would follow suit. We had about two miles to go before we would come to the bad places, and when I got off, the next man would get off and so on down the line. By doing this, we got down the canyon very well, except that three of our pack mules rolled over a cliff and were killed. The head of the company got out of the canyon at about 11 o'clock that night. We were within six or seven hundred yards of the Indian camp, for the lake lay almost at the foot of the mountains. As the soldiers came down, they formed into lines, and General Johnston and I started to find the bunch of willows we had seen from the top of the mountain. We soon found it and went back to the soldiers. The general said that was all he wanted with me until after the fight and for me to take care of the two Indians we had with us. So I got Yayabi and his friend, and we climbed a small hill not far away, where we could see the fight when it commenced. The soldiers didn't all get out of the canyon until about 3 o'clock in the morning, and the pack train was not all out when daylight came. In the meantime, General Johnston had strung the soldiers around the Indian camp. Just as day was breaking, an old Indian chief started a fire in front of his wickiup and was standing there calling to some of the other Indians when a soldier shot him without orders. Then the fight commenced. Oh my, how the guns did rattle. It was almost too dark at first for me to see much of the fight, but it was getting lighter all the time. I asked Yayabi if he was not afraid that his people would all be killed. He said he was a Mormon and those Indians were all bad Indians. So he did not care very much which whipped, the Indians or the soldiers. As we were coming down the canyon that night, the general gave me his field glasses to carry for him, and I still had them. Along the edge of the lake grew a lot of bulrushes. Soon after the firing began, I could see the papooses running into these rushes and hiding. From the volleys that were fired, it got so smoky that I could not see very plainly. But the shooting soon stopped, and as the smoke raised, I could see everything that was going on. By this time, they were in a terrible mix-up, and were fighting fiercely, the soldiers with their bayonets and sabers, and the Indians with their clubs, axes, and knives. I could see little children not over five or six years old with sticks fighting like wildcats. I saw a soldier and an Indian that had clinched in a death struggle. They had each other by the hair of the head. And I saw a woman run up to them with an axe and strike the soldier in the back. And he sank to the ground. And then she split his head with the axe. While she was doing this, a soldier ran a bayonet through her, and that is the way it was going over the whole battleground. And what a noise they made, with the kids squalling, the women yelling, the bucks yelping, the dogs barking, and the officers giving their orders to the soldiers. This was the worst battle and the last one that I ever saw. It lasted about two hours, and during that short period of time, Every Indian woman and child and every dog was killed. After the battle, I was sent to bring up the baggage wagons to haul our wounded to Camp Floyd. General Johnston made me a present of $100, and I didn't know any better than to take it. As we were on our way back to Camp Floyd with the wounded and were passing through a rocky canyon, we were fired at by some straggling Indian, and I was shot through my left arm about halfway between the wrist and the elbow. The same bullet that went through my arm killed a soldier at my side. The one shot was all we heard, and we did not even see the one who fired it. 
I had sometimes wondered that if that bullet was not sent especially for me. That spring, the Great War between the North and the South broke out, and General Johnston sold all of the government cattle and wagons very cheap and went back east with his pack mules. I have also read through the book titled The Life of General Sidney Albert Johnston, written by his son William Johnston in 1878. I could not find any mention of the incident. Does anyone know if General Johnston's journal is available? Next, here are a few excerpts from various books detailing the atrocities in which the Native Americans in this place and time were forced to endure. This first account is from Nevada, A History of the State, by F. E. Mona Mack, 1936, pages 295 to 296. Jacob Forney, having been appointed to succeed Brigham Young as superintendent of Indian Affairs in the territory of Utah, hastened to Salt Lake City to take charge of his work. Forney was not able to cope with the situation in western Utah. Nevada at that time was known as the western part of the territory of Utah until the year 1861. There were many murders, robberies, and attacks on immigrants reported to President Buchanan, who ordered General A.S. Johnson, in charge of the army in Utah, to send some of his troops to protect the immigrants along the trails. Major Isaac Lind of the 7th Infantry, was ordered immediately to patrol the routes west of the Salt Lake. In 1859, Robert B. Jarvis succeeded Agent Forney for the western part of the Utah Territory. He was directed to collect the Goshutes and Shoshones on farms. When he went to their territory, he had a council with 73 of their warriors. He found that in their previous efforts to farm the Deep Creek Valley, the Indians had dug up the ground with sticks. They had planted about 50 acres of wheat, but grasshoppers had descended upon the fields and destroyed them. Agent Jarvis became so discouraged after a few months in office that he resigned. In June 1859, Frederick Dodge was appointed in his place. At the time he was making his first visit among the Indians, the Comstock Silver Strike was made public. The entire situation was changed again. Hundreds of white people began to rush into the western part of Utah. In most accounts of the Indian outbreaks of 1860, very little mention is made of the gross outrages committed against the Indians by the white men. There was a set of fellows who kept little grog shops called trading posts along the routes of travel in which the chief stock of trade was whiskey. Since there was practically no government at all in western Utah in 1860, these white men took advantage of conditions to commit the most egregious crimes, well knowing that they would never be punished. The Indians, exasperated at these repeated injustices, took matters into their own hands. Finally, this can be found in Bancroft's History of Nevada, Colorado, and Wyoming pages 219 to 221. On the 23rd of May, the governor met Winnemucca and his people at the lower bend of the Truckee, but nothing came of it. In August, 11 immigrants, men, women, and children, were killed by the Indians on the Humboldt, eight miles east of Gravelly Ford, and their bodies cast into a stream. Thereupon, General Connor issued the order to shoot all male Indians found in the vicinity and to take no prisoners. When savagism and civilization fight, let me ask, is it savage warfare or civilized warfare that the white men engage in? The operations of Connor, who assumed command at the District of Nevada and Utah in August 1862, 
against the Paiutes of eastern Nevada and the Snakes, Shoshones, and Bannocks of Idaho are given elsewhere in these histories. Meanwhile, desultory hostilities were carried on with the Goshutes. A company of regulars under Captain Smith crept upon a camp of Indians in Septo Valley on the 4th of June and killed 24. Next day they killed five more and the day after 23. Horrible massacres these acts would be called had the Indians perpetrated them. 29 of Winnemucca's men having been killed for stealing cattle by a cavalry captain in March of the year last named. A conference was called at which the chieftain handed a catalog of crimes committed against him by white men, which far outnumbered those which could justly be brought against men of the same regiment, aided by 30 citizens of the infested region. A battle was fought at Rock Canyon on the 15th of February, in which 115 Indians were killed and 19 prisoners taken, with the loss of one soldier killed and Major Smith and six privates wounded. By reference to the second volume of my History of Oregon, it will be seen that the troops in that state and in Idaho were driving the Indians south, while the Nevada troops were forcing them north, so that truly the Indian had no place to lay his head. Owing to the milder disposition of the Nevada tribes, as well as to the swift vengeance by which any resistance was met, probably 250 or 300 white persons have been killed by Indians in Nevada, while ten times that number of Indians have suffered death at the hands of white men.